it's really exciting that Lauren was actually one of my first recovery stories on my YouTube channel. This was like two, three years ago. So uh, you've had quite the journey. That's the reason that I was excited that Lauren was going to do this with us here today, because I really wanted to get people who have been through what most of us, you know, most of you watching and myself have been through because she really gets it. And for me, gut health, addressing my gut health is a massive part of my recovery as well. So I just, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think for everybody, um, you know, anyone, whether you've been diagnosed with a chronic illness, CFS or not, I think just everybody to really focus on what's going on with their digestive system is just super pivotal in terms of, of everything, because as we'll go into, our gut connects with our various aspects of our health. And, and I like to call it the seat of our health, really, because it impacts all those various different bodily systems, which we know are very much affected in CFS and, and various other chronic diseases. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to learn stuff today. <laughs> I'm so going to be healthier <laughs> one week from now, one month from now as a result of, um, of this. So thank you. <laughs> all right, let's do this. Yeah. So, so first of all, did you know essentially that the food you eat can influence your energy levels, your gene expression, your brain chemistry, your mood, your immune, your immune system or your immunity, uh, your digestive well-being, and so much more. And in CFS and autoimmunity, we see these various aspects of our health become impaired. And so it makes great sense for us to empower ourselves to make nutritional change. And again, as I said earlier, you know, even if you don't have a diagnosable disease or you're just looking to improve your longevity and your health, these systems of the body are largely affected from what we're eating. Um, and if we know that and we're empowered with that, then we can look to make sensible changes um, and empowered changes moving forwards for our for our health and um, yeah, and our, for our longevity. So I thought I'd start by introducing this concept of bioindividuality. It essentially means that there is no one size fits all diet for everybody. And every single one of us in the world is biochemically unique. We all have a highly individualized um, set of nutritional requirements, and this can be deciphered from various different factors that are either internal, which could be our genetic makeup, um, our hormones, our immune tolerance, which is our ability to tolerate certain foods through our immune system, um, our metabolic profiles, and whether we say have certain nutritional deficiencies or demands, and also, of course, our gut health. And then we also have external factors which affect our, our relationship with food, such as our stress levels and our lifestyle patterns. So in a nutshell, you know, there's a lot of people online that are always kind of giving this panacea of, OK, let's go with this approach. Let's go with this approach. And it's this way or the highway. But I'm really a big believer in this concept of bio individuality. And I think that as we move through different cycles and stages of life, we you know, we do have maybe different requirements based on our goals, based on our health profiles, um, and, and what we eat tends to kind of change, but also these demands certainly change as well. So anyway, that being said, obviously with this kind of concept of bioindividuality, I like to marry this with some kind of basic nutritional common sense, especially when it comes to these kind of rooted in science nutritional principles that will suit the majority of people out there. And especially when we're working with chronic disease like CFS and autoimmune disease, I do tend to see common patterns amongst clients. And one of the key kind of things that I'm seeing clinically is food intolerances and food sensitivities. Um, you know, this is kind of widespread and especially when it comes to gut health, obviously it's very, very relevant there as well. Um, but I just thought I'd kind of highlight the difference between a food intolerance and a food sensitivity, because there's often a lot of confusion and, you know, people always say, oh, I have allergies and, you know, obviously allergies are, are an entirely different thing, uh, which involves an immune mediated reaction um, involving an immune, an antibody called um, immunoglobulin E, IgE. Um, and that is kind of where you're dealing with these kind of severe responses to food, whether it's say like a peanut allergy, um, you know, people that say go on an airplane and you can't be around anybody that's had nuts because it could be a life threatening reaction and it tends to be lifelong. But with people who have um, intolerances and sensitivities, I always like to say they're like shifting sands because they can change throughout life. And they can wax and wane through, you know, anything that we go through hormonally with our immune system, for example. Um, and then not, it's like more of a gray area in, in kind of to, to explain that a little bit more. 
Um, but essentially, a food intolerance typically involves the digestive system. So that would involve something like if you're lacking, say, an enzyme to break down nutrients, um, such as, say, lactase, in the case of lactose intolerance, which is essentially the enzyme that helps to break down the sugar that we find in dairy products, or our gut bacteria starting to kind of get a bit of a, have a little bit of a party and start to ferment food components within our gut and, you know, release gases and can contribute to things like bloating, abdominal cramps and pain. And um, so it tends to be that food intolerances, the, the symptoms tend to be more gut related. Whereas with food sensitivities, this is more of an immune mediated reaction. So it's essentially where the, we call it loss of um, oral tolerance to a food. So our, our body cannot handle our immune system, shall I say, cannot handle the foods that we're eating. And it can cause this inflammatory load. And this is where we start to see these, they're called extra intestinal symptoms. So kind of widespread symptoms within the body. And these can very much mimic things like CFS, autoimmune problems. So we see things like fatigue, brain fog, headaches, joint pain and skin complaints. And, and this can often occur through something called leaky gut syndrome, which I'm not sure if any of our audience have heard, um, but it's basically a broken gut barrier. So within our gut, we have all these cells and these tight junctions, which are meant to kind of stay woven together within the fabric of our gut. And what can happen with leaky gut syndrome is essentially where food proteins can leak out into that bloodstream and essentially incite an inflammatory cascade. Um, and obviously, if you're dealing with any chronic problem, that is really not what we want to be having. Um, and we look at things like gluten and gluten is often kind of associated with this leaky gut phenomenon. Um, it very much can help. You can very much drive up this this permeable gut barrier situation, which is why a lot of people that are dealing with chronic fatigue and these autoimmune complaints take out gluten from the diet just to kind of lower that inflammatory burden that's on the body. Um, so that's kind of food intolerances and food sensitivities. And the common culprits here, as I said, gluten is obviously one of those. Dairy can be one. So we can have issues with lactose. I also see issues with the proteins in dairy, like casein and whey. Then there's FODMAPs, which um, especially getting a lot of um, airtime in terms of IBS, because FODMAPs have been linked with a lot of IBS symptoms, such as um, bloating, diarrhea and constipation and various different issues there within the gut. Um, but essentially FODMAPs is are fermentable sugars. Uh, so basically kind of short chain uh, carbohydrates, which ferment or well, are fermented by our gut bacteria and can contribute to um, various different gut issues. And um, then we also have things like eggs, Histamine. Histamine is um, essentially a byproduct of the immune system, uh, which actually helps with the inflammatory response. But we also get it in foods. Um, and so with histamine, it's all about it's not necessarily a food intolerance as such. It's more I, I guess it's a bit of an oversight to call it a food intolerance because it's more an issue with metabolizing and breaking down histamine. We tend to see that in people who have had a lot of allergies and allergy symptoms. Um, so it's kind of trying to keep the right histamine balance, but there are foods like tomatoes, uh, fermented foods, for example, avocados that are very high in histamine. Um, and these can be a problem for those that are sensitive to, you know, or have allergy kind of symptoms going on. Uh, and then we also have sulfur and sulfur is a mineral, um, which we find in protein rich foods like chicken, cheese, beans and lentils. Um, and that again, it's it's trying to keep a right sulfur, this right sulfur balance. Um, so as you can see, this is a whole minefield and I could talk about it for days. <laughs> um, but it just shows you kind of how confusing it can be to navigate what you should eat, especially if you've got a chronic situation going on like CFS, autoimmune disease, or just generally looking to lower your inflammatory load in the body and really support your system for health and longevity. And um, so one of the approaches that I take clinically is, is, is how can you identify these food intolerances or sensitivities? The way I like to strip it back is through doing this three stage approach, which is um, the food monitoring phase, the elimination phase and the reintroduction challenge phase. So the food monitoring phase essentially involves completing a three week food and symptom diary. Uh, which helps you to identify trigger foods 
or food components in the case of things like histamine, FODMAPs or sulfur, for example, um, that you can identify as associating with your symptoms. Um, and then there's the elimination phase, which is once you have you know, gotten more in tune with your body and you start to really kind of deep dive and isolate any suspected trigger foods, there might be things that you just have a, have a feeling on that just maybe aren't sitting quite right then it's about essentially eliminating those from your diet for a minimum of six weeks. Um, and then really, again, staying on, on with the food diary and just staying on track with those symptoms, trying to clearly observe those to see if there's any symptom improvement. Um, if you do observe a symptom improvement from removing one food, it could be two foods you've removed, three foods, then you can move on to stage three. But if you haven't, then you check to see if you fully removed a suspected food from your diet. And um, for example, if you've taken out gluten, is there anything where you're maybe sharing a toaster with somebody where there could be some kind of reaction going on still? So maybe just check to see if you're fully stripping that back from your diet to really see what the response there is. Um, and yeah, sometimes you might just need a little bit more time to see if symptom improvement occurs. But if it doesn't, you might not be intolerant or sensitive to that food after all. Um, and then the, the reintroduction challenge phase, this is all about just really seeing where those tolerance tolerances lie. Um, so it's reintroducing the foods that were eliminated, but with the goal of assessing whether eating them again will cause your symptoms to reappear. So always reintroduce one new food at a time um, because that won't leave any discrepancy between, you know, if you've introduced gluten and dairy together on the same day, you're not going to be able to tell what's what. So always one food at a time to observe any reactions and then wait three days before anything else is introduced. And that's because sometimes we can have a slightly delayed reaction to a food. Um, it might not, not be 24 hours, but it can could be within 72 hours. So it just helps you to kind of see if there's a delayed response. Um, if you do have a symptom recur, occur as a result, then eliminate it again, wait until the symptoms subside, and then you try and introduce any other new foods that you've maybe eliminated. And you can always go back to retesting those foods again um, that give you symptoms after you've tested all your other challenge foods using the same reintroduction challenge approach of waiting three days for any delayed reactions to occur and then so on. Um, but yeah, so if a reintroduced food still gives you symptoms, then strip it back from your diet for three to six months and then you can reassess. And it's not necessarily always about, you know, doing this for life. And, and I think I've got a slide about that in a couple of slides down, but it's really about saying, okay, if something is reacting with me, how can I strip that back and just give my gut and my immune system a chance to repair and rebalance? It's something yeah. I've actually forgotten about, you know, with the food intolerances, because I used to have massive issues with this, which yeah. I'm sure is relatable okay. for a lot yeah. of people. I got to the point where I felt like every bite of food I put into my mouth made me feel worse. And it just got really overwhelming. And yeah. over the years, most of that has healed. But sometimes I still will feel unwell after certain things. And I just, yeah, it's hard to make those connections. So it's really good that I like your three stage process that I think that's really helpful I am going to yeah. have to try that <laughs> yeah and I think it just helps you step back in tune with your body as well yeah. so like like looking at what you're eating and in fact if I just go on to the next slide it really helps you to understand like this is this is an, an example taken from my book of of an example food and symptom diary of it's not just always about exactly what you're eating yes obviously you can maybe identify food com culprits say if it's maybe like you know the cheese that you've eaten and that's had an inflammatory response or something like that. But also looking at the lifestyle factors around that. Have you, you know, somebody had an argument with their partner here um, or they had a stressful day at work or, you know, they've not eaten, um, they've not chewed their food properly or they've eaten on the go or they've been on their menstrual cycle. So there are all these other factors as well that will contribute to these kind of system overloads and symptoms. And sometimes it's just important to kind of understand the foods are sit within a picture of our wider lifestyle. Um, but it's just helpful to do these things because it helps you to kind of build that picture of understanding. And once you've done that for say a three week period and you think, okay, mm, every time I eat cheese, this is happening. Or every time I eat gluten or, or if I'm eating onions and garlic, which are like high FODMAP foods, then this happens. Um, 
but then also you can chart that in relation to how stress affects you and, and everything else. Um, so this is just a really great approach for stepping in tune with your body um, and becoming, you know, just wiser to the responses of, of what we're doing daily um, and how that's impacting us. Yeah, I think that's one of the silver linings of this whole process for many of us that have gone through these horrific chronic illness experiences. It's that it's like this boot camp in teaching you how to listen to your body. And most of us went through our lives. No, I would I didn't used to listen. I had no clue before I got sick. My body could be screaming at me. And I don't even know it wasn't even that I was ignoring it. I don't even know that I heard it. You yeah. know, and I just wasn't making those connections. So Yeah. A hundred percent. And yeah, it definitely gives you, I think an experience like that definitely gives you insight into how you can really listen to your body because I think you're almost forced to in a way. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, there's pros and cons to it, but um, but it definitely brings up this question as well is like, you know, when you're kind of dealing with anything where your body and your system is in very, very sensitive to a food, do you need to avoid it for life? Because I had those questions, um, you know, when I was unwell was, should I avoid gluten forever? Should I be dairy free forever? It affected my social life, it affected my relationships, everything. So again, as I said earlier, our ability to tolerate different foods can alter over time. And I like to think of food intolerances as like shifting sands, particularly as our microbiome, which essentially that community of, um, of bacteria and microbes that live within our gut, but also as our immune system and our hormonal profiles change. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, this isn't the same as food allergy. Um, so that's important to note, because obviously, if you do have a severe food allergic reaction, then that is something that obviously I would advise consulting your doctor or healthcare provider with. Um, and obviously, in that case, it may be a lifelong thing. But certainly by taking these problem foods from our diet uh, for a period of time, it gives those, you know, that gut and your immune system a bit of a breather and a chance to repair and rebalance. And it shouldn't mean having to exclude everything forever unless it's causing you trouble still when you introduce those foods. I see it as a question of quality and quantity. So if you are reintroducing gluten after a period of an elimination, and as I say, there may be, there may be is a case for removing gluten for a period if you are trying to really kind of reduce that inflammatory fire. Um, but if you're introducing it back, it's a question of quality and quantity. I always say try and opt for the ancient and organic grains. So things like einkorn, emma, and spelt. Um, and if you're going, you know, if you're looking at organic, that's because a lot of the wheat crops um, and the barley and things like that are often sprayed with glyphosate, which is kind of our key, well, I say our key, our, our main pesticide that's used across the world, which is really detrimental for our gut bacteria. Um, so it's really not in our interest, uh, in, the, in the best interest of our overall health and longevity. So always try, and, if you can, to try not for those organic grains. And I think it's all about assessing for individual tolerance, because as I say, by individuality, we are all very much unique. Um, and we all have different food scripts as well and ways that we relate to food. Uh, so these things also need to be taken into account. Um, so yeah, so kind of moving on to the five hour approach. So kind of after the fact of dealing with and addressing this kind of food intolerance or food sensitivity and um, if there is anything that you suspect is going on there um this is my five hour approach which is essentially working on the gut and the body's terrain um, and when we look at the gut the gut is essentially the intersection of the various body systems that play a widespread role in um our health and longevity so we have 70% of our immune system actually sitting in the gut, and that's called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, um, or the GALT. <laughs> and we also have an entire nervous system in our gut, so a huge network of neurons, uh, which very much explains that feeling of when we're nervous, we get butterflies in our tummy, and we start to feel symptoms in our gut, maybe if there's we've got an exam or a job interview, and um, we know that there's this big nerve uh, called the cranial, well, the vagus nerve, which is a large cranial nerve, which comes all the way from the back of the brain stem and right into our colon. Uh, and this is showing how the gut and the brain are intrinsically connected. So we have this gut brain axis. Um, but actually the gut bacteria that we have, they also educate and train our immune cells. So, you know, things like white blood cells, they can help them to train to spot, um, you know, friend or foe. So, you know, is a food protein say something that we need to target an attack on um or even our body tissue like autoimmune uh, disease you know where we're kind of attacking self 
versus non-self, which would be bacteria, viruses and invaders. So, so it's really about understanding how important this gut is in terms of our overall longevity. And the aim of the game with the 5R approach is to create a flourishing microbiome and really deal with any imbalances that we identify within the digestive tract. So the microbiome, um, let us know if you've heard about it before, I'd be very interested. Um, it's getting a lot of buzz now on a lot of these kind of, um, you know, gut health platforms and podcasts um, and just overall health and longevity podcasts. And, you know, everybody's talking about the microbiome, but it essentially refers to the microorganisms residing within the gut. Um, so it's our bacteria. It also comprises of parasites, yeasts and fungi. And I also forgot to mention there that viruses as well. So we do have viruses that live in and on the body. And it might interest you to know we're more bacteria than we are human. But we're also, and I talk about this in the book, we're more virus than we are bacteria, which I was fascinated to learn. Really? Um, and that, yeah, so that's called the virome. And um, so we have, you know, trillions and trillions of bacteria living in the gut and obviously in different areas of the body, like on our skin and, and in our mouth, for example. Um, but we also have viruses living in the gut and in other various aspects of our body, like our lungs um, and different other systems. So, yeah, so those viruses actually can have an impact on the microbiome and they can actually kill off certain bacteria and modulate the levels of those bacteria so as we're learning just how important this bacterial ecosystem is we're also finding out that we have a viral ecosystem as well which i found mind-blowing <laughs> i had no idea i always hear about the bacteria and the massive amounts of bacteria in and on our body and i knew that there were viruses but i know i had no idea that it was such a high level but it's fascinating yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I find that fascinating as well. Um, so yeah, so in terms of going back to the bacteria, um, we, we definitely know more about the bacteria and their role to play with our widespread health. So I'm going to kind of keep the focus to bacteria here. Um, but we have over a thousand or just over a thousand species of bacteria in the gut that have been identified. And if we actually were to kind of weigh those bacteria within our gut, um, it would make up the weight of our brain. Or I think it's like one or two bags of sugar or something like that. And um, so actually there's a huge amount of this bacteria um, and we can liken this to different classes of bacteria as well. So we have this idea of beneficial bacteria, which play beneficial roles for our health. And we also have disruptive types of bacteria, which are more harmful for our health and can be implicated with various different diseases. Um, so each bacterial species has its own unique function. So we're starting to see things like lactobacillus, the different species and strains within there. Um, have been associated with digestive health. So kind of, you know, for example, having, because we, again, with gut bacteria, we have to have this kind of sweet spot um, of, you know, a level where they're not too high, they're not too low. Um, but in terms of kind of lactobacillus, so low levels of that has been associated with, say, IBS. Um, and things like acomancia, that's one that's associated with, um, if you have low levels of it, it's essentially associated with obesity, type 2 diabetes, and those kind of metabolic uh, diseases. Um, so that's one that, you know, if we have higher amounts of it, we're more likely to be um, to be trim, more in shape, um, and less likely to have all these metabolic problems, essentially. Um, and then fiber. So we'll talk about fiber in a minute, but our gut bacteria love fiber. So we don't actually have the enzymes to digest and break down fiber, but our gut bacteria absolutely love the stuff. And um, so we essentially eat fiber, which is the roughage. And it's a plant-based carbohydrates found in all of the different plants we eat from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes. Um, and as I say, when we're, break we're eating that, we're not breaking it down, but our gut bacteria start to nibble it up and they start to produce these anti-inflammatory byproducts called short-chain fatty acids. Um, and they have a huge role to play in terms of modulating inflammation, protecting that gut lining, which we talked about earlier. Um, and we're just coming to understand the role of, of what these metabolites from our gut bacteria are having. And really what we're starting to find is that we need this level of bacterial diversity in order to stay healthy. So we have something called dysbiosis, which is which essentially refers to an imbalance of the communities of 
bacteria within our gut. Um, and that could essentially involve an overgrowth of beneficial bacteria. It could involve an overgrowth of more harmful bacteria. Um, it could be a deficiency of beneficial bacteria or even just a lack of diversity. And really what we're starting to see is associated with positive health outcomes is this diverse ecosystem, almost like a tropical rainforest. If you think of all the different species that live within that habitat and that area, um, then that's kind of what we wanna be looking for with the microbiome is just diversity of those commensals, those beneficial types of bacteria and just different species and strains. Uh, and that's a really fantastic marker for good health. So what can we be doing to support that ecosystem and to really work through this 5R approach. Well, the first thing I always recommend to clients is this is this first one, which is kind of the stripping back. Um, and it's essentially removing or limiting. And again, I always kind of use the word remove lightly because sometimes people find that they, they like to have some middle ground here, but definitely looking at these kind of common culprits um, that can be potentially driving issues in the body. So ultra processed foods, that is everything from, you know, anything that's essentially I always call it like packets and promises. You know, you, you see a packet of something and it might say, oh, low in fat, this, that, the other. Um, basically the top right, you can see it all here. Those ultra processed, ready meals, high sugar foods, snacks that are laden with, you know, whether it's refined sugars, um, additives, emulsifiers, you know, just where they've manipulated the ingredients and they are not in their whole food forms. They are very much kind of a recipe for inflammation um, and can just drive chronic, chronic symptoms. And really, it's a, one of the it's, I say it's one of the easiest things to remove. It's one of the easiest things to identify in the diet. Uh, but some, some people who have problematic relationships with food, it can be, you know, there's a lot of psychological stuff going on there that needs to be worked through for them to kind of work on removing those and, and kind of stripping back to um, a more whole foods based diet. And then artificial sweeteners, which tend to be quite problematic on the gut, especially because a lot of these kind of contain sugar alcohols um, and these ferment in the gut. So they're quite high in FODMAPs um, and our digestive system doesn't properly absorb them. So they just go straight through to the large intestine where the gut bacteria have a field day uh, and start to ferment. Um, and then things like caffeine. So caffeine it's a bit of a mixed bag with caffeine because some people have different tolerances to caffeine in terms of um, how it affects them. So some people are quite fast metabolizers of coffee and some people are quite slow metabolizers. So some people might have no reactions after drinking, say a cup of coffee in the morning. And some people are very, very sensitive. And I'm actually one of the very, very sensitive people. I'm a slow caffeine metabolizer. Um, and I get the jitters. I start to fit because it causes issues with my blood sugar. Um, and so I have to be very careful if I do drink coffee and it, I will never drink it on an empty stomach. And um, I'll always try to have it with something um, to make sure that my blood sugars are balanced, that it's not compounding that blood sugar roller coaster. Um, alcohol obviously is another culprit that will also compound this blood sugar roller coaster, which can basically cause a lot of issues for our hormonal health. Um, and again, we say remove or limit so it's not always necessarily about going cold turkey overnight with these things and it's just about working on okay looking at your overall you know food diary your overall lifestyle and thinking how can we just strip some things back that potentially could be driving some issues here and um, trans fats trans fats is essentially what you find in things like margarine uh, these are the hydrogenated fats you'll also find them in maybe say packets of crisps like Doritos or confectionery, like um, not confectionery, baked goods like these cupcakes, for example. Um, and these are essentially types of fats that have been manipulated and aren't necessarily recognized well by the body uh, and can contribute to an inflammatory cascade. They've been associated with things like diabetes and obesity. And, you know, when we're dealing with things like autoimmune disease or CFS, we just really want to kind of, or any, con you know, chronic illness, or complaint, we just want to make sure we kind of lower that inflammatory burden. So these are kind of the main culprits that we explore and we look at. It's really reinforcing about the caffeine because I had to remove caffeine entirely when I was working on my recovery from MECFS. And then, you know, some people ask, like, is that forever? Because I talked about it in my book, too. And I, I love that how you explained how variable it is. And because that makes a lot of sense, because, you know, I have my coffee every day, but it's more than 90% decaf because I 
it's really like the placebo effect coffee that I have. There's really yeah. almost no caffeine in it. It's just a comfort. But I do notice that blood sugar roller coaster and all of these things that it sets off in my body and the jitters and then I crash later gives me really yeah. unstable energy, like severe throughout the day. And it's yeah. something that took me a long time to realize with chronic fatigue syndrome because I did rely on caffeine for quite a while. And in the afternoons, I would crash so hard, like severely laid out. And once I slowly scaled back coffee and I did it by slowly transitioning, like half and half caffeine decaf, three quarters, you know, I didn't have to go cold turkey, but I noticed I wasn't suddenly cured from CFS, but my energy became much more stable. So yeah, I think that's such a big one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think that's it. Life isn't black and white and neither should this be. And and that's why I kind of always go back to that bio individuality and, and that personalization piece is that, you know, I'm never going to prescribe like a my way or the highway approach because that's the basis of how I work is, is about everybody's unique. And, and that's essentially how we operate in our clinical practice. So, yeah, totally with you on that. And that was a big part of my journey. I was kind of caffeine free for a long time and then recently introduced it. And then I noticed that was actually there were a lot of days where I started to have kind of negative effects from it again. And I was like, hmm. I think I just need to kind of, we just need a bit of a break for now. So I've kind of taken it out for a period. Um, but yeah, I try not to use it as too much of a crutch for, you know, if I'm feeling a bit low and I just feel like, oh, I need a pick me up because I just try to be, I think of, okay, what, what else could I be needing? What else could my body be wanting? Yeah. I didn't realize the impact on the gut health. So that's really good to know. That's another mo motivator yeah. for me to. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously with the caffeine, restrict. Can increase gut coffee because it can aggravate the system and cause an increase in gut motility as well. So if you're prone to say loose bowels and things like that or diarrhea symptoms, then caffeine is definitely one to kind of strip back. So replace. So this very much works on addressing what we want to introduce. So for, the first thing to say actually here is if you're following a, an elimination diet for a suspected food sensitivity or an intolerance, this stage will come after the reintroduction challenge phase because you don't want to be adding things in that potentially you've removed and then you're kind of you know you're confusing the 5r approach with the food sensitivity approach so it's really about you know working on the system and um, so obviously we've stripped things back in the remove stage but then the replace stage would then involve really working on your digestion and absorption so looking at things like your stomach acid levels so there is a little test you can do called the baking soda test. <laughs> and it's just, it's not based on rigorous science, but it gives you a bit of an idea. Um, and it's basically where you, you take a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda or bicarb of soda, you put it in half a cup of water, and, and then you, you do it first thing in the morning when you wake up without brushing your teeth or, or doing anything else. And um, you just drink this in half a cup of water and you time for five minutes how long it takes you to burp. So it's called like the burp test. <laughs> and um, and basically within that period, if you was to burp, say, within the first two minutes or quite immediately, uh, that could be an indicator that you've got high stomach acid. If it takes you five minutes or longer, that's more of an indicator that potentially could be low stomach acid levels. Um, and obviously we need the kind of sweet spot of stomach acid to help break down our food, but also to neutralize pathogens from our food as well. Um, and sometimes we can have these pathogens that can end up within our small intestine, which is where they shouldn't be, leading to this overgrowth of bacteria called SIBO, uh, sort of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So just really working on stomach acid levels. So if you need to kind of look at that, see that test is just a little indicator and um, of what potentially is going on there. But you can do things like just adding in like a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar into some water and, and drinking that before meals to help with stomach acid um, and just raising that and secretions like, you know, having things like bitter foods and um, like, you know, dandelion and dill and chamomile, for example, bitter melons, another one. Um, so these things can just help with these secretions and even just lemon juice in hot water. These will help with these like secretions of our gastric juices. Um, and then just really focusing on chewing your food properly. I know it's maybe it's over said, uh, but maybe actually not really said enough for a lot of people is that we just sometimes inhale our food. And if we look at really the environment around which we eat, because so many of us are around tech we just eat at our desks. We don't take time away from our phones or our laptops or our screens. And sometimes just having that reminder that we just need to 
support that digestive process um, because that's, you know, or see digestion starts not within the mouth, but actually at the moment where we start to look at the food, where we start to engage with the food, that's called the cephalic phase of digestion. So it's where we start to really tune into the sensory components around a meal. And that's the point where we start to release these acids and secretions and, um, you know, these digestive juices to actually anticipate and things like salivary enzymes, et cetera, to actually anticipate the moment of eating. Um, it's like, for example, if you think about, if I was to say, think about a lemon, um, and if you think about a lemon, I don't know if you start to kind of feel like a bitterness and like a saliva kind of thing coming on. That's kind of that cephalic phase. It's like you're kind of engaging within the sensory aspects within your brain. Um, and it starts to secrete these like digestive components. So really focusing on the environment and making eating become a ritual. Um, something that we're, you know, we're enjoying, that we're celebrating, and that's a positive thing. Um, and we take the time to really sit and appreciate that meal in front of us. Uh, but these, the things that we really want to be incorporating, uh, protein is really, really key. It's like our body's building block. Um, it forms things like our skin, our hair, our nails, even our antibodies in our immune system to our hormones all kind of built from protein building blocks. And when we look at protein, we really wanna be thinking about like a palm size, one to two palm size servings of protein on our plate. So that if if you eat animal products, that would be like lean sources like um, fish, it could be uh, turkey, it could be chicken, prawns. Um, and if you're obviously eating, um, if you're not eating animal products and you're vegan or vegetarian, then that would include things like beans and pulses or you know nuts and seeds, for example. Um, to get those proteins in. And then complex carbohydrates, that's things like sweet potatoes, you know, your whole grains, your brown rice. Um, and when you're thinking about building a balanced plate, you want to be thinking about like one fistful of complex carbs, you know, so again, this is not prescriptive, this is just to kind of help build an idea. And then when it comes to well, we'll talk about vegetables, I think on the next slide, but in terms of vegetables, you want to be looking at two fistfuls of non-starchy veg. So that's kind of half of your plate, which would be anything from bell peppers to broccoli, to mushrooms, to tomatoes, to aubergines, onions. It goes on. Green leafies, which we'll talk about in a sec. When it comes to fats, we want to be looking at healthy fats, which are those mono and polyunsaturated fats as much as possible. And um, so things like avocados, nuts and seeds, um, you know, a little bit of dairy, high quality dairy, for example, as well, like feta cheese, for example. Um, and, you know, adding that, that could be about one to two tablespoon sized serves. So kind of or thumb sized servings, like a drizzle of extra virgin olive oil or a sprinkling of seeds on a salad. Um, but just making sure you get those kind of three macronutrients in um, and you're building your plate around this kind of diverse array, array of um, non-starchy veg. So that's like half your plate. But we really want to be popping in things that are really fantastic for our system. So I always talk about green leafy vegetables. So, you know, if you can get like one cup of green leafy veg um, into your diet a day, that would be fantastic because of the, the bonanza of different nutrients that are within there, especially for fighting fatigue. So we'd see things like magnesium, iron, um, folate, which is one of the major B vitamins in things like spinach, Swiss chard, watercress, kale, rocket. Um, so if you can try and aid for those, that, that would be fantastic. Um, and then B vitamins. So B vitamins are those kind of, um, well, those nutrients that are the water soluble. So our body needs to be topped up with them every single day. And because we we lose them when we're stressed uh, with day to day demands. So, so B vitamins really vital for kind of fighting fatigue. So as I say, switching to those whole grains where you can. Um, and when it goes back to kind of working on the, the digestive system, you can get lots of enzymes, which enzymes basically help to assist the digestive process. You can get them in foods. And some of the best foods for those are papayas, pineapples, kiwi, avocados, ginger, and then fiber. And um, as I said, fiber being brilliant for feeding those gut bacteria, always try and go low and slow um, when you're increasing fiber, especially if you've got gut symptoms, because then your gut bacteria can get a bit of a field day. Um, so just have try and inc increase them in increments um, and try and aim, aim, as I said earlier, for half a plate of, of those fiber rich vegetables. So re-inoculate, this essentially involves just achieving microbiome diversity through things like prebiotic foods, and fermented foods as well. So prebiotics, I've got a list there, 
Things like onion, garlic, bananas, if you go for the greener, the better, because they're going to be higher in these prebiotic compounds. Uh, fennel, leeks, and asparagus, again, better if it's raw. So you can maybe incorporate some chopped raw asparagus into a salad if you want the prebiotic benefits. Prebiotics essentially feed the bacteria communities you already have in your gut. And fermented foods like kefir, kimchi, kombucha, and bio yogurts and sauerkraut will actually add these live, they actually have these live micro uh, microorganisms in there. So you're actually basically adding in microbes into your food, but really beneficial ones. Um, and people can consider a probiotic. I often use stool testing clinically to kind of help target unique insights on what people's unique you know, gut status is and their unique requirements. Um, but really, one of the best statements I always say to clients is every time you eat, you're not only feeding yourself, but the trillions of microbes within your gut. So always remember that, and it can help with understanding why these compounds are really fantastic for our gut and for our health. And um, so kind of going on to repair, which is the second to last, this is the fourth of the five R's. Repair is all about working on nurturing the gut lining via, so as, as I kind of talked to you earlier, this is the, the, the leaky gut scenario. These are the normal type junctions that kind of line our, the cells within our guts and our gut mucosa. And uh, when we get gut uh, permeability or leaky gut syndrome, we tend to see these gaps and then things start to filter into the blood. And this is where we get this inflammatory reaction. So things that are really fantastic for this um, include gut supportive amino acids. And um, glutamine is a fantastic amino acid. So if you are and um, vegan or vegetarian and you don't consume animal products like say bone broth, bone broth is a fantastic source of all four of those um, amino acids listed here. Um, uh, so if you don't, then a supplement, a glutamine supplement could be really beneficial for you. Um, but also working on anti-inflammatory foods for nurturing that gut as well. So I've highlighted here ginger and turmeric which are really fantastic spices to kind of incorporate into your, your routine, whether it's grating some ginger into a smoothie in the morning or a stir fry or some salads. Um, it adds a really nice spice or even turmeric. If you want to add, you know, if you get ground turmeric, add it to curries, soups and stews, um, Asian dishes, everything. You know, these pair really well with pretty much everything that you can cook with, but they're just a fantastic thing to, you know, to add. And I always think that food first approach is brilliant just to kind of make sure that you're, I guess, hitting the nail on the head with all of the things that you could be doing to really kind of counter this inflammation process, which obviously underlies so many chronic Western diseases. That's repair. And then rebalance is really about adopting an embracive approach towards foods once we've had restoration and tolerance that's been restored. In fact, if I just jump back, I wanted to say that the fewer food sensitivities we see, this is a sign that our terrain and our, our gut lining is being restored. So the more intolerances, the more reactions we're having, it might be a case that there's more of this going on. Um, and the more we start to see restoration happening, that's a great sign that we're seeing healing and repair working in the gut. Um, so yeah, the rebalance is all about what happens after this fact. It's, you know, maybe you've removed foods from your diet and you feel like things have become super restrictive for such a long time. And you've maybe it's placed a really large burden on your relationship with food. And I know that was definitely me. <laughs> And, and this is where we look to rebalance and gain a positive and embrace attitudes towards eating again. So there might have been foods on the remove list that you strictly took out, but it's important to not beat yourself up about things like, for example, if you have a bit of alcohol or you maybe have an ultra processed food every once in a while, I think an 80-20 approach is really important for kind of social and emotional well-being. Uh, you know, we use food to celebrate, we use it to bring people together. So, you know, and I think when you're going through a kind of chronic health complaint and you've noticed that symptoms have been kind of there all along, especially when you've eaten and you associate food very much with your symptoms, we start to get this nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect is the opposite of the placebo effect, which is where you essentially start to think, if you think something negative about a food, then it's gonna affect you negatively. And I'm not saying that this is all psychological, but there's certainly a role to play in terms of mindset and you know, the mind body connection in terms of how we're eating and how that's impacting us with uh, these chronic uh, symptoms that are going on in the body. So really here it's working on the sympathetic, uh, sympathetic nervous system and reducing that stress response. So working on the parasympathetic, which is our calm relaxation response, especially around food, 
So doing things like maybe breath work around eating, journaling to really look at those thought cycles that are maybe going on around food and challenging old norms, maybe how we related to food in the past um, and how we could approach something that's a bit more of um, an achievable, restorative and more balanced way of eating that still will help bolster our health and our gut health. But at the same time, make sure that we we allow for that balance and that social connection that we don't feel restricted and we're not on on a regime forever. Um, I suppose that kind of just sums everything up. But ultimately, a healthy diet is one that embraces diversity. So a key tip I always tell clients is to make sure you try and rotate your foods. Um, it's not always about eating the same thing every day. I mean, if we eat blueberries with our porridge every single day, then we're only maybe feeding a certain handful of bacteria that like blueberries because the, the types of fibers that are found in blueberries. And whilst that's great, you're maybe staving off the opportunity to feed other types of bacteria in our gut that like cherries or blackberries. So it's always about rotation. And if you can go to the supermarket every week and try new two new plant foods out, um, that's a great tip just to try and ensure that you've got um, more things going into your routine that, you know, is just keeping you accountable for change and diversity. And you're not getting the same thing day in, day out. Like, oh, if I bought broccoli last week, maybe I'll get cauliflower this week. And just keeping yourself accountable for different types of plants that you may be not used to cooking with. And um, so trying to search out creative recipes that just keep things new and keep things, keep things spicy. <laughs> Um, so my final kind of tips today um, to incorporate this week is just don't overcomplicate it. And I know that's kind of a targeted approach that I use clinically. Um, but, you know, if you feel that there's any reactions to your body and foods, um, keep a food and symptom diary and focus on those mini wins. So like any changes that you're making and um, celebrate them because habit change can be difficult in the initial stages. So really focus on celebrating how far you're going and, and the intentions that you're putting in and nourish those gut bugs. So incorporate that fiber and you know build that balanced plate as I was explaining with the half plate of non-starchy veg um, and that dietary diversity. So trying to keep yourself accountable and try two new ingredients each week. So that's me, I think Raylan. So that's, yeah, this is where you can find me. Um, so my book, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Your Route to Recovery is out now and you can order it on my website or on Amazon um, is all about chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, and it empowers you with the belief that recovery is possible. And I think, especially when you read around the subject of ME and CFS, a lot of it is doom and gloom. And I was very much in that, in that situation when I became unwell, Googling symptoms and not necessarily thinking I'd ever get well and um, being told that there was no, no cure or no chance of progress and improvement. And so my book is split into three sections to raise awareness of CFS. The first part is my story, uh, journeying what happened to me. The second part is, is what is CFS? Um, so it explains the science, the symptoms, um, the proposed causes and the medical hypotheses of essentially what we know so far about CFS and ME. Um, and then I outline the road to recovery. So I talk about my three pillar approach, which very much kind of looks at those lifestyle factors. So diet, lifestyle, and also mindset whilst adopting this root cause approach to recovery. And that's very much the basis of how I work is kind of almost trying to find like the needle in the haystack for my clients of, okay, what could be the root drivers of what is going on for them? And these are my handles, should you ever wish to find me. Amazing, Lauren. This is hands down, I think the best information session I've ever had on nutrition and gut health. I've read so much. I've taken in so many podcasts and so many things. And there was so much that you shared today that I didn't know. I have learned a ton. This has been absolutely amazing. My head was exploding all over the place. I'm like, what? What? Uh, well, thank you so much. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm so glad that we recorded this because I'm going to go back and watch this again. I was wanting to take notes while you're talking because there were so many gems here. Um, so um, thank you for this. This has been just so, so helpful. And I know that people watching are going to appreciate it. So thank you, Lauren. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Raylan. And for people who are watching the YouTube recorded version of this, everything you need to know will be in the video description. So all of Lauren's links, all of her contacts, I really encourage you to expand that uh, and uh, take a look at what's there. And for 
those of you watching, I'll also link on the screen here, Lauren's recovery interview that she initially did with me. She's got such a fascinating story and such an inspiring story from being really, really unwell to, if I recall correctly, literally running marathons. So she's just um, really come a long way. So I definitely recommend that you check that out. So yeah, thank you again, Lauren. Thank you to the people who joined live. Thank you to those of you watching on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. And um, yeah. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, guys.